Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Public Works Finance Committee meeting of the Moscow City Council for Monday, December 11th, 2017. Joining me here today is Walter Steed and Gina Terusio from the Council and Jen Piffner representing the city staff as well as Sarah Banks. Uh, we'll get right started with the uh, approval of the Public Works Finance Committee November 27th meeting. Minutes. I would move approval of that, sir. And I was not in attendance. Okay, so the okay. two of us will do have you, to do establish. As you wish. <laughs> we'll have to say that we're uh, a quorum, and uh, I'll recommend that we approve them. Awesome. <laughs> Item number two today is the disbursement report for November. Gary J. Reedner is not in attendance, and so we'll depend on Sarah Banks' expertise for that. Yes. All right, good afternoon. So the major expenditures for month ending. <laughs> oh. Man down. <laughs> see, see what I mean? To you? <laughs> <laughs> <That's enough. clears throat> yeah, that's good. Oh, All right. Just yeah. jump I get, that's right. Get my uh, get my own uh, new tablet one of these days. I <laughs> won't do that anymore. Proceed. Okay. So major expenditures totaled two million five hundred and forty one thousand three hundred and eighty nine. Payroll was the largest expenditure. It came in at nine hundred ninety eight thousand eight hundred two. We had some major expenditures in capital outlay, and a couple of those are um, a $447,000 payment to booster station phase one, and then we had a well six pump replacement, and that totaled $194,000. So those are the two largest expenditures that we had going on. Um, we did do our Microsoft software license renewal with Dell, and that came in at $62,346. And we did the Indian Hills Park concrete, and that was $58,812. So. Okay. Anybody have any comments or questions about that for Sarah? Uh -uh. Looks pretty straightforward to me. I don't see any extra zeros on any of these numbers. So. No. Uh, entertain a motion to approve the disbursement report for November. So moved. Second. All, right. All those in favor? Aye. We'll go ahead and put that on the consent agenda for next Monday's meeting. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you, ma'am. Is that your, whose is this? Uh, that's Jen's. That's mine, yeah. Yeah, that's I think mine. it's mine, actually. <laughs> it's, it's an awfully nice pen. <laughs> We're all trying to <laughs> co-opt the pen. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Item number three on today's agenda is 1810 Nursery Street Lot Division, and uh, Ryan Cash is going to tell us about it, and he seems to have... An unlimited collection of ugly sweaters this time of year. That's not ugly. That's he, a great sweater. He came in like fourth place in the at the potluck. He was close. It was really close. It I was. really like your sweater. I liked the one on Friday too. Thank you. He's winning sure today. Sure to hand it down. <laughs> you can't wow one with brilliance. Do it in style. That's right. I'm all about making a statement, I suppose. I well, I'll stick to that. Public now. Works Finance Committee is governtainment at its finest. <laughs> so when you're <laughs> watching that on TV, we want it to be entertaining. Absolutely. Right you want to keep your, your visitors and your That's viewers right. glued to the screen. It's ratings <laughs> month, and we want to be right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, uh, commissioners, thank you for uh, giving me the time to speak in front of you about a lot division at 1810 Nursery. I'd like to direct your attention to the screen here. So we have a application for a lot division. S Shelley Bennett's requesting a lot division on behalf of Indian Hills Trading Company from a 10.36 acre parcel of land legal legally addressed as 1810 Nursery Street, uh, which is located between the corners of Powers Avenue and Southview Drive in the city of Moscow. As you can see up here, we have Southview, Highway 95, and Main Street, the subject parcel, including the dedicated parkland, Nursery Street going north-south, and to the east-west on the south perimeter, we have Plouce River Drive. 
So the applicant proposes to establish two parcels of approximately 3.26 acres and the remainder 7.10 from the 10.36 acre parcel. As you can see here, parcel one is the subject parcel that is proposed to be divided. And parcel two shows our dedicated parkland and including the Moscow Booster Station property. The subject property is located in the farm, ranch, and outdoor recreation zone where the minimum lot area is three acres and the minimum lot width is 80 feet. The two proposed parcels will meet all minimum lot area and lot width requirements for the FR zone. Just looking at surrounding other zonings, we have R1 to the north along Indian Hills. We have R4 multifamily to the west. Along Pluse River Drive and Highway 95, our motor business districts, and to the south and to the east, Farm Ranch. So as previously anticipated that Powers Avenue would be extended to the northeast to connect with the future extension of, of Southview. And here you have Powers Avenue right here, extending down to Alice Street. However, in order to, in order to accommodate that residential development, um, the, the proposal um, didn't include that continuation of Powers Avenue. Uh, since the current proposal does not include that extension of Powers Avenue, a cul-de-sac is required to be constructed at the terminus of Powers in order to meet city standards and the inter international fire code. As you can see here, we have a image from earlier this month taken looking down the intersection of Powers and Nursery Street, and you can see the terminated Powers Avenue with no other way of turnaround or egress. So in order to take care of that, the, the current proposal does not include the extension of Powers Avenue. So the cul-de-sac would be required um, in order to meet those standards. Also, in order to accommodate the cul-de-sac, the owner would need to dedicate additional right-of-way through the deed of dedication, which would be approved by the council at a later date. So this shows the proposal for the conditional use permit tonight, but more importantly, it shows how the divided lot looks on the site, plus the proposed 96-foot cul-de-sac that they included in that application. Here's a little bit of a closer look of the 3.26-acre parcel with the terminus of powers incorporating a cul-de-sac. So just, that's just for spatial reference for the commissioners to consider. So in accordance with the City of Moscow requirements, property owners with 600 feet have been notified of the proposed division. The site has been posted greater than seven days prior to the meeting date. Recommendations coming from multiple departments. It's pre previously anticipated that Powers again, Powers Avenue would be extended to the northeast to connect to the future extension of South V Avenue in order to accommodate residential development. The current proposal does not include the extension of Powers Avenue, and in order to do, do that, they would need to accommodate uh, a cul-de-sac in order to meet the city standards and national fire code. And it's staff's recommendation that we recommend approval of the lot division request with condition that the owner dedicate property for and construct a 96-foot diameter cul-de-sac to city standards at the terminus of Powers Avenue prior to any building permits being issued upon the subject property. Depending on any questions you might have of me, uh, if, if I may, you mentioned a booster station. Yes, sir. Where what? Uh, so the the booster station is part of. Can you go back to the sure mapping. So and I'm sure Public Works can maybe interject a little bit more information about the the site. But I know that Kevin Lilly is working on a proposed um, site location for having this um, uh, somewhere on this extra parcel. Um, again, this is not part of the application, uh, nor is the uh, the relocation of the dedicated parkland. Um, this is just a current state of where it, the, the land sits right now without any kind of other deeds or dedications. So the booster station would go on parcel one? The booster station would, would likely go on somewhere on parcel two. Parcel one is just the proposed lot division. I'd like to introduce Kevin Lilly to clarify some you know, questions. Sweaters at the same shop? <laughs> it's our battle Monday. Hi. Hi. Your socks match? <laughs> he called me. He called you. <laughs> uh, we actually have not yet selected uh, the final location for that booster station. We have had very brief uh, discussions about a parcel that is on this uh, picture, the upper left end of that uh, parcel two, up, somewhere up in, the, up, up in the corner up there. Yeah, possibility. There's also uh, just recently we began discussing whether or not uh, 
well, let me back up. There is a proposal to do some parkland swap that would take the make the first lot on the left as you enter Southview. Uh, yes, but further to the west, uh, possibly make that park. And if that is the case, we may end up locating the booster station there. This is all. Okay. Well, I'm, the way Ron said it a while ago, I thought there was an existing booster station out there that I wasn't aware of. No, sir. Okay. So, if I may. Thank you, Kevin. Um, maybe, maybe for you, because you mentioned the parkland swap. Mm -hmm. That's a very peculiar piece of land remaining between Parcel B and, and Parcel 1. What if the council doesn't agree with the parkland swap? What, what, do you, what do they end up with then? I have no idea. This is... Their, their plan, not yours. Exactly. <laughs> it would be through Parks and Recreation more than likely. Who's, David Schott is going to be the one that's handling that with Dwight. Um, so the two of them have been working out possible relocations of that of the subject yeah, property. I'm aware of that, but that's a council decision. Right. Correct. In the long run. Ultimately, yes, sir. So I was just wondering about the, the peculiar piece that they're leaving by splitting off what they are as parcel one. It's their business, not mine. But anyway, okay. That's spelled down that. Okay, thank you. Oh, we've got all kind of staff. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Bellinap has approached the table. Where, where's your sweater? <laughs> <laughs> Mine's actually quite, kind of plain today. Um, I was just going to comment that as the owner of the property does plant and develop adjacent properties, there will be additional parkland dedication that may be required. So should the exchange not be approved, you know, some portion could probably be added to that existing parkland dedication. And close off? Correct. Close that peculiar gap? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Okay, any any other? Go. I have no other questions um, or problems with it. Okay, I guess our situation now is um, we're, we would like to take public comment on this lot division. If anyone is in the house that would like to comment on this and or has uh, an opinion on it, um, we'd please approach the table and tell us your name and your address and <clears throat> what you think about it. Hi, my name is... Uh, my name is Michael Bradley, and you have that pointer? How do you turn it on? Oh, are you trying to, it's that big button right there. Uh, Where do you live, Michael? We live in Pullman right now. We own a property. Michael, if I could have you speak into the microphone, you can maybe have a seat. I guess I'll have to sit down. Yeah. Yeah. We own a property here on Indian Hills Drive. Ah, no. oh, Don, look, you just made it yeah. go away. You need to share your address with us, please. Address is uh, 810 Palouse View in uh, Pullman, Washington. Now, there you go. That, which uh, one right, do I push? Right on the top there. Just this one right that there. That one there. Yes, sir. Okay. We own a property. I've owned a property here for about 10, 12 years. I like Moscow. I love this property. But uh, it's right there. And uh, it's a bit of a, a, a difficult property to build on because... Indian Hills Drive comes along here, and there's a drop off about 18 to 20 feet from Indian Hills Drive down to my property or my wife and I's property. And there's a very simple solution to being able to build on that property and thereby increase the amount of property tax coming to you folks by simply giving us an easement in from here across this piece of property, which is really if you take reasonable 20-foot setbacks and, and rear-line setbacks, it doesn't leave much room to build in there. And it looks like they may be planning on building a, a pump station or something on it. i got no problem with a pump station if you leave enough room for me to get in here and I can build a house on their property. As it is now, when I look at the the uh, the constraints of, of putting uh, 20 feet of uh, concrete or fill or something in there in order to build a house where I can drive in from Indian Hills Road, um, it cost is uh, is prohibitive, and that affects the, the value of the property. I, I've tr I constantly have to come over and appeal the, the uh, assessments on the property, which is no fun for me, and I'm sure it's no fun for you, because it is a, uh, it is a property with difficulties. If uh, if I was Frank Lloyd Wright or uh, or another wealthy type of architectural person, I'd build a really nice house on there. 
But uh, again, the, the market for these houses and the value of them is such that uh, you, you, I can't justify spending $400,000 to build a house that, that would fit very nicely on there, and at least $150,000 of that money would just go into putting concrete uh, up so that I can have access <coughs> to here. If if I can have access across here with a with a simple easement, or if I can buy this property from the current owner, and uh, I've tried to contact them about that a number of times, I'd be happy to build on there, and I like it. My wife and I both like the property. So you have approached Indian Hills Trading Company about purchasing that. Tried property? a number of times, contact them, never heard anything back. So uh, you know, it's just it's just like uh, lost cause. I understand the folks who live over here have done the same thing. Tried to reach them about buying this kind of orphan piece over here and haven't gotten anything back. The fox on this lot here, when they built their house, they had to buy the lot next door and put a sloping driveway down, which is a real problem. And then they, you know, they uh, again the value of their property was severely. Uh, impacted by you know by what they had to do in order to get down there to build a house. So and again, a simple easement across here to this lot, that lot would have solved a lot of problems and and kept these properties from suffering economic uh, uh, damage because of the again uh, just the terrain. You know, I'm not naive. I I knew it was a difficult lot to build on when I when I bought it 12 or so years ago. The economy was very different then. It would have made sense at that time to invest fifty to eighty thousand dollars to actually build a nice house on it because the resale values were high relative to the investment cost of that. But that has not been the case since uh, two thousand seven or so, as we all know. So that's that's basically what I'm asking: uh, is that if you're going to do this, uh, make some arrangement for me to obtain some type of an easement to my property so that my property becomes uh, buildable, essentially buildable at reasonable cost. As, as I look at the lot division situation here, it doesn't really change the ownership or change the, the viability of what you suggest by this lot division doesn't really affect that. The same people still own the piece that you want to put the easement across. It's just they're cutting off a piece to put the Palouse Charter School yeah, on. Yeah, I, I would say that this um, sounds like an issue that's very much related to what we're discussing today, but the issue at hand is that one particular lot that we're looking at. That's um, And we're happy to, of course, work with you and see if there's anything we can do to help on that front. But I think um, it is within the, uh, the capabilities of government to facilitate uh, something like it this. Would, it would need to be something between... I'm happy you to and the <laughs> and the property owner. I'm happy to work with the property Bill. owner, but at and the same can, time, Bill like I mentioned, we, ask Bill yeah, a if the property owner is reluctant to speak to other people, it's difficult for us to force that. Yeah, but. that's true. Having just heard this, Bill, can you think of any reason, if he were able to make a deal with the landowner and wish to use their, he buys from them property to get access to the lower part of his property? Would the city have any particular problem off the top of your head? We would not. Um, as long as they had came to a, a private agreement between the two private property owners, you okay. could have an easement that provide access. The required street frontage does exist, so the property does have legal access to Indian Hills Drive. Um, but the council would not have the authority to grant or take a property right, right. to g give access to a property that already has access in conjunction with a lot division for an entirely like, Right. Separate project, but, but for first at first blush, you don't see any reason the city would have a problem if he were to strike a deal like he's talking about. You can negotiate an easement, or even buy and make it a flagpole lot with access off Southview Drive, and okay. do a, and do a lot line adjustment to make that change. That'd be mm -hmm. easily accomplished. Sounds fine. Want to talk to me? I'll got a check. Be your gentleman. Uh, you'll have to contact the property <laughs> owner, sir. <laughs> yeah. Start with the property. Yep. But Bill can Bill can give you probably a name and a phone number that help you facilitate. Talking to him in some fashion. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank I think you there's coming. a representative of the owner that uh, came in, Jack Hammonds, here. I'm sure you can speak with him. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Mr. Bradley, for your comments. Um, I guess if that's all the public comment we have, I guess I would recommend that we uh, go ahead and approve the or forward it to council for approval of the lot line adjustment. If anyone doesn't no have problem. a problem with it, I, with um, 
I'm hopeful that Mr. Bradley can work out a deal to make that happen. It'd be certainly in his best interest and and uh, our best interest in terms of taxable property. So um, I think we should put this on the regular agenda for next Monday's meeting, so the full council can see what's going on here. Okay, item number four. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Uh, on today's agenda is uh, Idaho Transportation Department 5339 Capital Grant Project Funding Agreement, Bike and Bus Shelters. Elisa Anderson is going to tell us about that. This, this has been in the works for a while. Yes. Good afternoon. I'll just, um, since we have um, some new people here today, not on your committee, but in the audience, I'll just give a little bit of a history on this. Um, this is a grant, again, that we applied for in 2016. There were four components to the grant originally. Um, two of them we have before you today. The prior one that has already been completed is that we purchased um, a 15-passenger <coughs> van, and that was um, a lump sum of a total project cost of 35000 and um, we had a $7,000 match with a $28,000 um, grant in that part. And we're in the process of putting together a reimbursement request. The van has been, is it out now, Jen? Is the van operational? No, the van's been delivered and stickered, and we just got the title and everything um, through ITD in the last couple of months. So we'll be readjusting some routes to take some of our older, smaller minivans out of our van pool fleet. And moving to the larger vans, which are a better, better investment for the program. Cool. Okay. So before you today, we have um, two additional contracts um, to complete this project. The first one before you is for the bike shows and bike signage, and um, it is covered under a component that has a ten percent match for this part portion of it, and so. Um, with that, we have a contract or an agreement that we have um, included in your packet. And yeah, number myself. four is the bu bus and bike shelter. Oh, am I, do I have the shelters. other ones back? We've got I had it wrong in my folder. Since we have okay. three. <laughs> I'm sorry. I looked at my agenda incorrectly. Okay, let's back up a step. <laughs> I apologize. And you have every item on the agenda. Yeah. <laughs> it's an unprecedented number of grants. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's back up. So. The first item I have before you today then would be the bike and bus shelter um, grant. And within your staff report, um, we have noted that um, the total project costs are 208000 And we have a blended um, match on this project because bike match is 10% and um, bus or bus facilities is 20%. So the total match is 36450 with a federal award of 17250 and um, the contract period, uh, we've had some adjustments to this contract with locations. So the project period is past where we are right now. As you can see, um, ITD actually didn't get us the contract until. Those numbers don't match what's on here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 114, 8. I think your numbers are from for the ones ahead of us in the queue there. Um. Because we've got 114,800. Okay, let me get my agenda in front of me. I apologize. Oh, that's okay. I just I thought something I wasn't reading right. So okay, that doesn't match any of the numbers. So what has happened is the titles aren't matching the um, description the underneath, so they should be turned around. And I may have posted them incorrectly in the agenda software. So where we are right now is um it seemed like it was more correct in the packet elisa the one in front of me not not on the agenda but in the packet is item four it's itd 5339 mm -hmm. for bike and bus shelters for 114.8 mm -hmm. okay i'm looking at my sheets okay I'm not sure exactly what one, happened. It's the one with the list of, of, of bike and bus shelters that are in the, in the packet document. Okay. I'm going to go off of my actual documents and not look at this document. How's that? Um, for the bike and bus shelter. That's the one. Okay. Total project costs are $141,000. Um, the federal request is $114,800. Uh -huh. And the match is $26,200. Uh, that matches what's in the packet. Okay. 
I'm not sure what happened with my document that I printed out. I may have gotten an old one. Um, we have a blended match on this one also. So for bike parking, the total for the um, covered bike shelter that will be located here at City Hall, total project costs of 20000 with um, federal funds of 18000 and a match of two. Okay. And for the bus shelter installations, and the um, shelters are already owned this, yes the shelters were purchased by smart a little over two years ago okay. and um, so this is just installation they, they are in inventory and these include the pads and Nate can kind of go over the construction and installation of that after I go through these numbers correctly um, so yes um, the construction is the 96 8 Okay. So that's the installation of the shelters and the sidewalks and ADA improvements leading to each of the locations with a match of 24200 So down in the box. And, and the, match, the match in each case that you're talking about is coming from where? The match has been in the budget and carried forward since 2016. It is in the FY18 budget now. General funds money. Capital projects. General funds budget dollars. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I'm going to let Nate go over the <clears throat> individual locations. I was just going to say we own all of, we currently own all of the uh, bus shelters, but we would still have to purchase the bike shelter. Yes. That's the one yes. that we don't currently yes. own. Yes. And we will procure for, for city that. Hall here. For the, in front of the city yes. hall. So that yes. would include the purchase of uh, the bike shelter, uh, double decker, uh, bike parking, and a bike repair station. And that's included in the $20,000? cost or that would be extra that's included in the whole project cost of which the match is that twenty thousand dollars okay so the 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 individual bike shelter the to, the total project cost is twenty thousand oh. and the grant amount is eighteen okay so that twenty involves that twenty thousand or they is is included purchasing is included in that yes buying the for the bike shelter awesome. yes okay yes awesome yes, yes. yes. Okay, and the locations, um, as we had previously discussed, the bike shelter would go at 3rd Street and City Hall. Then we have bus shelters at D and Mountain View near Egan. Mm -hmm. Almond Street, south of East Street, which is behind Rosars. Cool. A Street and Peterson. A Street and Cherry, which is near Superior Floors. And then 3rd Street and Hayes near East City Park. Cool. And then just a bench at F Street and Orchard. And Nate can give you um, a little bit of detail on each of those locations. So essentially the majority of the locations would be the uh, reinforced concrete pad that would support the structures that would be attached to those. And then any additional sidewalk modifications that are necessary to provide an ADA compliant path to approach all of these different shelters or benches. Um, in one case, there is the um, acquisition of a small amount of right-of-way the, in the case of the Peterson and A, and that would be from the, uh, the University Village apartments there, and we've already spoken with the owner, and he is amenable to um, basically having that, providing us the easement in, or the right-of-way in order to have that shelter near their, their facilities. So. And SMART is on board with all these locations? Yes, these locations were chosen a couple of years ago, and even with the um, increase in ridership, these are still the areas that need um, shelters, yeah. or the priority yeah, areas. Door, please. Mm -hmm. So before you, we have the funding agreement, standard funding agreement um, through Idaho Transportation Department, public transportation. So it's a little bit different than what we normally see. It doesn't have the resolution and those types of things with it. And we have until um, September 30 of um, 2018 to complete this project. Okay. okay, so to be clear, we've got 114.8 in the grant and we've got 26.2 for match. And, and that the 26-2 is part of the FY18 budget currently. So all we need to do is approve the acceptance of the grant. Just say do it. Yes. <laughs> so I, th I think this is a consent agenda item and um, the confusion about which okay. one we were talking about. Notwithstanding, <laughs> I think we want to go ahead with it. <laughs> I apologize. I'm not sure uh, what happened. I'll have to look at it after the meeting. But I have the... the
the documents in front of me to move forward now with the bike share and signage agreement. Mm -hmm. And total project costs on this one is $32,500. Um, federal grant amount is 29250 and the total match is 3250 And these improvements will go on the existing um, um, bike system that has already been designed and approved. Okay, I, need, I need to catch up with the numbers on this one. So 208000 paint a lot of sheriffs for $208,000. Thirty-two thousand five hundred is total project costs. Okay, I've got I've got a total project cost of two hundred eight five hundred in the in the packet. Really? For the five three three nine. Five? That was that's the total project. The overall. The overall project. Okay. When we were looking at all three projects combined with. <laughs> with, <laughs> with um, the van. And the project we just previously approved, and the um, bike and bus shares, the bike shares. I don't, I don't mind you confusing us. When you send these in, though, make sure they're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're all they're all the five it's three, like three a, nine. It's, there's yeah, almost like a, there's some words pounds. missing, and I don't know if I didn't copy and paste it correctly or not. But something didn't come through right all the way, and it's my my error, and I apologize. So the first paragraph in your staff report is talking about the total project, okay. and then the um, the agreement that's attached. And the attachment A are the accurate numbers. The numbers that are down in the staff recommendation are accurate. So it's a twenty-nine two fifty. Yes, yes, that project. part of it is. for the grant okay. award. Yes, yeah, just I looking apologize. for the recommendation for approval for that portion of the three prong yes, project, right. um, okay. part right. of which has already been taken care of and managed. And there's no match associated with that twenty-nine two fifty. Yes, three thousand two hundred and fifty dollars. Okay. That's not on. Uh-uh. Okay, Elisa, the, the packet says matching funds of 2000 on the Sharrows and signage one. So this one says 26 to It should be 3250 Okay. You'll pick that up I will before, fix before that. council? Yes. Yeah. Even though the chair is going to probably put this on consent? I will just, correct just all of it. Stay ahead of you. Yeah, we'll just... Yeah, well, if it, we'll look at it when we get the council agenda, and if it doesn't have that on there, then we'll pull it off and discuss yeah, it further. Somebody can pull okay. it. That's true. That's true. And I don't want that to happen, so I'll make sure it's right. <laughs> And I apologize. Um, the only excuse I have is that I did this really early in the morning, so I didn't get it all in there well, accurately. This is a really late a confusing night. array of grants and matches and. and I have looked at these numbers so many times over the last two and a half years <laughs> that I may be seeing things that aren't there just because they're all unstuck in my head. So I apologize. Is that, is that a formal recommendation for I'm, I'm going to say we go ahead and recommend approval of this grant because it's part of the other one in the first Great. place. And that we just make sure that we have that the agenda, uh, the council agenda for next week has the correct matching amounts. and. Um, yeah, it needs to show that. But it can be on consent agenda unless we foresee or unless we observe some problem that needs to be corrected at that time. Yeah. Okay, so moving along to the we're we're away from the five three three nine now, and we're moving on to local strategic initiatives program. So this is an, an additional grant application. Yes. And let me move all my papers out of the way. So this is a new program. Um, it's the first time we have seen this. It's called the Surplus Eliminator Program, and it was established new under House Bill 312 in the 2015 legislative session. And um, the law states that at the end of the year, the state will take remaining funds, and they will be split between a rainy day fund and a surplus eliminator program for state transportation projects administered by the Idaho Transportation Department. So then during the legislative session, um, they were able to determine the amount. And a question that we had 
um, prior to committee today within that um, project description or program background description it states that 60 percent of the money is to be to the state and 40 percent to the local systems that doesn't refer to match that means that the <coughs> state is keeping 60 percent of that total pool for state projects and then the other 40 percent is being put out to local governments such as the city of Moscow for projects on this on, um, are we, are we competing with highway districts um, out of the 40 percent well the highway districts are considered local government that's what I mean yeah yeah okay so I would I would say that you know there'll be projects from county highway districts and other cities that yes we'll be competing against so before us today um, we have a project that um, is really an opportunity that we've never had in the past because it's allowing us to do maintenance and that is not something we've been able to do before and they do require shovel ready projects so Nate has put together a PowerPoint for you um, and he'll go through um, our project and kind of the guidelines of this new program okay Nate sir with the engineering office so mm -hmm. um, and as Elisa had mentioned I'll direct you to the PowerPoint here um, but uh, this is you know it was established as part of the surplus eliminator program and there's the 60 40 split that she had mentioned so yes Walter we will be competing against you know any of the the local jurisdictions that, that qualify yep um, so as Elise also mentioned it must be related to maintenance and address safety and mobility and the way the um, state defined maintenance is the focus is only on existing roadways and bridges so we're not allowed to create any new infrastructure with this project but any projects that are either on existing infrastructure or adjacent to existing infrastructure would qualify and again as Elisa mentioned they must be shovel ready projects which in this case was defined as be able to go out to bid within 90 days of the date of award and in this project they're anticipating the award date be sometime in the middle of January Wow! so it's a it's a very short turnaround they're trying to prove the efficacy of this program and demonstrate it to the legislation before the next legislative cycle so uh, one of the nice things about this program is there is no match requirement it is essentially a grant um, the requirement is that any unused funds at the end of the cycle are returned to the state and they're put back into the pool for the next next uh, grant cycle so the way they broke this down is there is a maximum request of one million dollars and each municipality under 200,000 residents is allowed a single request over 200,000 you can have a second request but that doesn't apply to us so uh, our proposal is to uh, use this grant as a funding mechanism for the pavement preservation program for 2018 and uh, we propose that the proposed program is to install approximately 265,300 square yards of slurry seal and this actually corrects a transposition error that calls it 269,200 yeah. so the the dollar amount is correct but the the um, square yardage of the application was changed so based on our estimates in the previous year's bid year bids that we have seen we anticipate the request not to exceed five hundred thousand dollars so, um, here these are just general maps I don't there obviously you can't see any of the details this one is talking a little bit is demonstrating some of the previous years where we have had slurry applications and as you can see typically a slurry application goes on a road that is slightly older but has not started to experience any deterioration yet so it's a way to reseal and provide a new wearing surface with the goal of trying to extend the life of a, a good road to basically have a, the biggest bang for the buck for the taxpayers um, here again you know don't focus too much on this this is just showing the proposed areas and we'll go into a little bit more detail on this and um, these are the three kind of areas that we've broken the broken it down into for demonstration so area one is West A Street and West 6th Street so these are again these are fairly recently constructed as far as road lifetime is concerned um, but they are 
beginning to show some wear, so this is a, a good time for this treatment to reseal and to provide that additional wearing surface. And in the case of the West 6th Street, this is where the, um, this, the trunk line project came through. So it's a relatively new asphalt, but there are um, utility raising, there are cuts that are along the, the roadway. And by resealing that road surface, the goal is to, to help you know, ensure the longevity of this road. Uh, the second area is showing, and on here. down the Gambino's Patties area? Yep. Okay. Yes. I assume the gap in that on A Street is because it's going to be reconstructed there yep. in 19, I think? Or? Yeah, exactly. And so the, the way this was selected by staff is to try to, um, if a road it has deteriorated too far, it's not a good candidate for this treatment because if the cracks are too large, this won't seal them up and you'll essentially just end up with a crack at the end and you might as well have not used this treatment. So and that and other projects which are planned in the future that we already know there's going to be reconstruction there, so we avoided those areas. Um, and this here is uh, kind of the Sunnyside neighborhood, the Southview Avenue area where uh, was demonstrated where the lot line adjustment is going to be taking place, and then over in the Indian Hills and uh, kind of the Alturas area there. Um, and then the third area is a larger area. These are some of the, you know, more main corridors. We've got. You know, F Street, D Street, Mountain View, and Sixth, all you know, big throughput areas that are, are experiencing a pretty large volume of traffic and a, and a high level of wear. So, and then uh, finally, that's all I have for you. Are there any questions on that? A million dollar limit, why are you stopping at a half million? Um, because the, the way the, the priorities were selected, you know, we didn't want to just spend money just to spend money, and those were identified as the best candidates by the street department, th that total volume. So, if I may? Yeah, go ahead. So, this will complete, should this be successful, this would complete the slurry seal needs for the city of Moscow? For the, for the foreseeable? For it, the next year. <laughs> it, it, did y'all pick blue shirts on purpose today? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, we just missed all kinds of memos. Uh, it's it's standard, but we don't have our sweaters in engineering. That's so. <laughs> um, Nate's, oh. Nate's probably struggling a little bit here because this is a little bit beyond um, the overall planning aspects that he does. Uh, the uh, slurry seal program will continue. This is just the next year. Part of the um, the reason for the five hundred thousand dollar cap is what is the capacity of the streets crew to prepare the streets mm -hmm. for this type of treatment. And so we've identified what we think we have the capability to do as part of the project and then set the overall project scope within that capability. Also, it's from a competitive standpoint for getting funds, if you applied for a million, you might get nothing, but you might get your, your probability of getting some money is higher if you come in a little bit lower maybe. If you're not quite so greedy, then maybe you get something instead of nothing. Yeah, I think that's always a, a, a potential within grants a consideration that, yeah, if, you're, if your request is, is larger, uh, then they have less likelihood of being able to fit you into the overall funding picture. Whereas that a little bit smaller, if you know, depending on how many projects and applications they have, they have better opportunity to fit multiple smaller projects into the into the funding program. What's Make the more people happy What's the pool <clears throat> of money? Do we know how much the whole? It's eleven million dollars. Eleven statewide. million. And that includes statewide, and that includes both the local strategic initiatives program and the children pedestrian safety program, which we'll hear about after this. Okay. And when we when we look at um, also the the quick turnaround on this, um, you know. As Les said, there's only a certain amount of availability that staff has time to put something together and turn it 90 days, so 120 days. Yeah, I think when you look at, if there's 11 million statewide, um, for us to try to get, you know, somewhere around 8% of that is not very likely. I think you're probably mm -hmm. better off to go shoot at something that's achievable. So Right. There's also a list of questions that was shown in your handout. Um, yeah, the attachment and you know in order to address all of those questions and put together a strong application this was the area that we felt most comfortable with dollar amount wise uh, I, I think I would 
recommend approval of the grant application here. It seems seems like a no-brainer. You can get money without match. It's always a good thing, and um, we could certainly use the treatment on the streets. So, right on. Consent agenda. Thank you. Anybody, unless anybody disagrees. No problem. Can always pull it if we change our mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Item number seven is the Children Pedestrian Safety Program uh, 2018 grant application. Okay, Les is Less less approaching the <laughs> Les has a, a PowerPoint for us, so I'm I'm also just going to introduce this program to you. It's also new and it's under the same state house bill that we um, talked about with the prior application. Um, this grant is also um, um, on a quick turnaround and the maximum amount available to apply per entity is two hundred and fifty thousand and I will let Let's wow. move into his presentation. This is a project that we thought would very well fit our current efforts uh, in the Third Street Corridor. As you recall, as part of the uh, decisions by the City Council to move forward with construction of the Third Street Bridge in 2018, uh, the City has also said that we're going to look at the corridor and potentially uh, install facilities along that corridor um, that will help address changes in traffic patterns. So the um, Transportation Commission, of course, picked this up at the request of administration, and they created a subcommittee uh, that has been diligently working the last month, two meetings a week in the evenings for a couple hours each, each time, um, that is looking at the with detail what types of things could be done within the corridor. Okay. We are nearing the end of that process. I'm giving you this background because it explains where this project is going. This we're like meeting six or seven now, aren't we? Yeah, like we're, we've gone through, I think, seven now, and, and tomorrow night is the last meeting number eight, and then mm -hmm. on Thursday is the Transportation Commission meeting, regular scheduled on the 14th, and the commission subcommittee will be making a report to the commission on the work that they've been doing over the past month. Uh, out of that are multiple plans um, that have been identified as potential for uh, making changes within the corridor. Some of those fit quite well with this, within this particular grant program. Um, I do want to mention, though, that once we go through transportation, it's anticipated we'll be then going out to a public outreach process through December and in, into January with transportation picking us up again in January and then ultimately coming back to council with a final recommendation on what kind of improvements and adjustments to make within the corridor. But the work that the subcommittee has been doing has allowed us to reach the point where we've got a pretty decent feel of the type of improvements that might be involved in the corridor. So that's what I'll talk about a little bit. Part of the reason that this matches well is a lot of the, the consideration that's being made within the corridor is to address pedestrians, and specifically to address pedestrians around the high school and around Lena Whitmore Elementary School. They're both on the corridor or in close proximity. They both have a lot of pedestrians that use the corridor uh, going to and from schools. So that, along with the timeline of doing the improvements in 2018, with the 90-day window that's on these grants, as Elisa outlined, it all fit together very well. So at this point, we have not yet completely finalized, of course, what the corridor will look like. That's those, those ongoing steps this week. We'll have a better idea, and then through the public comment process uh, into January to, to help pin all that down. But I can talk to you a little bit about what we anticipate might be there based on the work of the subcommittee and what kind of components then we would recommend be in the plan or in the application uh, and how they would fit with respect to uh, the intent of this particular program. So some of the components we're talking about uh, within the subcommittee, first off is sidewalk improvements, which is a pretty simple one with respect to the fact that there are gaps in the sidewalk system along 3rd Street and we want to close those to improve the um, pedestrian mobility routes uh, to and from the uh, middle school and the elementary school. How many linear feet of missing sidewalk? There are about 1,000 feet of missing sidewalk. Um, the first section of that is just east of Hayes. Uh, Hayes is here, and this is 3rd Street running east-west to Garfield. There's a chunk here on the north side that's missing. Don't put too much stock into the location of this and with respect to the curb line. We just are showing them along the curb where we end up putting them ultimately will depend on the individual lots. We work that out with the property owners. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> yeah, 
talking is hard. Okay, the um, the the next section as you head to the east uh, is east of Blaine. So there's a gap here on the south side between Blaine and Grant that we would uh, anticipate as part of the project, uh, continuing from Grant on over to Cleveland as well. Also a little bit of a gap there on the north side, uh, and on the northwest quadrant of the Cleveland intersection. How'd you end up with that? Hard to say. It's probably because there's a driveway there, and the walk was never installed on the rest of the lot, I would guess. So, so there's a small one there. Uh, continuing along the south side from Cleveland over to Roosevelt, there's no walk on that side. Then we do pick up walk a little bit, but we would have, well, no, I should not say that. Uh, there is no walk then east of Roosevelt um, until you get to the creek, and then east of the creek we pick up walk again. So this area on the south side uh, would be part of that. And then, of course, with the bridge construction, we'd also do the north side and close that gap. All of that adds up to about 1,000 feet. And so that's a, a very good candidate within this program because of the pedestrian routes and that will give you schools. continuous sidewalk from Mountain View to, to Washington on both sides of 3rd. That is correct. Okay. And Main Street and beyond, actually. But, yes, continuous What walk does it cost per corner. foot to install uh, cost per foot, I can't tell you. Um, we, we have numbers. We're working on the, the estimates for all of these concepts, uh, and we'll pull all that together. But um, this, this is well within the, the uh Yeah, it would seem well within the 250000 oh, I just yeah. wondered how much we would have left over for bicycle facilities. More. So let's go on. Um, the next piece um, that the commission is looking at is uh, raised pedestrian crosswalks. And these are something that are fairly new. Uh, with for us, um, there, we, there are, are a couple of examples within the community, but essentially a raised pedestrian crosswalk looks something like this, where you're traveling along the roadway, there's a crosswalk of the street, and where there's normally a six inch curb height over here, you actually create a ramp that comes up, brings the road level up to the height of the top of the curb and the sidewalk adjacent to it. So this becomes flush all the way across for the pedestrians, there's a ramp up, a flat spot, and a ramp down the other side for the vehicles. It does a couple things. The ramp is a vertical change, obviously, which then creates um, a somewhat discomfort as a driver if you're going too fast, right? So you tend to then slow down depending on the steepness of the ramp. It helps a little bit in terms of visibility. It also improves, um, you know, just the general uh, cross street nature of the pedestrians. Some quick shots of what these look like uh, just out there in the world. Uh, typically, this is the type of symbol you see under the Manual for Uniform Traffic Control Devices for the ramp up. This is the basically flat-ish um, crosswalk portion and then the ramp down the other side. Um, from the pedestrian perspective, it's essentially a straight shot, flush level all the way through. So from an accessibility um, side, it's they're great. Um, so they're, they're great, yeah, great opportunities. Here the ramp is coming up on this side and, dro and dropping back down on that side. Um, there are alternatives to these out there where you see sometimes a center median like this, um, where this section right here becomes a pedestrian refuge area, which is huge from the pedestrian safety perspective. You're coming across the street, you've got a spot you can linger for a moment waiting for a vehicle that maybe is not paying attention to go on by, something like that, but you've got a place that's behind a curb line so it gives you that bit of a refuge and, and safety component. So these types of things work really well, uh, and they are proposed in three locations at the moment um, by the subcommittee. The first of those is on the east side of the Adams Street intersection. So the high school is here off the bottom of the screen. 1912 Center is right here. This is a very, very highly used pedestrian crosswalk. Uh, the concept here at the moment is a 10-foot wide crossing with the ramps uh, on either side of it, roughly seven feet in length. Um, this option can apply to any of the plans that have been developed so far by the subcommittee. You'll see up here it's labeled Plan A and B. In this particular instance, there's also a Plan C. But we can do these in any of the plans. And so this is a, a type of device that I think would be appropriate uh, within this grant application at this location. Uh, a alternative to this uh, that's been discussed is the idea of putting one of those center medians in. So that picture a couple back, that one right there, mm -hmm. could look something like that with that refuge. So that's, that's an alternative. Um, so far the group seems to be leaning away from this one and just going with just the ramp or the raised walk itself. 
without the actual center median. But that is the technique that is also uh, on the table, if you will. And you can sleeve through or something to handle, <coughs> handle drainage? Drainage always has to be addressed, whether it's a sleeve through or catch basins placed with the construction of the ramps on either side. Part of what Walter's talking about is you'll end up with spots like this where maybe the drainage is running this direction. You get a ramp, well, it creates a pond here unless you have some kind of an outlet. So these would represent catch basins in that case um, to give you an, an outlet into the storm system. Uh, this is the second location proposed, which is the east side of the Monroe Street intersection. This is East City Park, so we're in the southwest corner of the park. Uh, again, uh, an area that uh, is not as concentrated in terms of you know daily traffic for pedestrians, but during events does see quite a bit of traffic um, going to the neighborhoods to the south. <clears throat> The third location I actually don't have drawn up, but it would be on the west side of the Cleveland intersection, which is the east end of the Lena uh, playground and ball field area or the park area, uh, another area that uh, sees a lot of uh, elementary school children uh, Nothing crossing. Blaine. Blaine, they're proposing a four-way stop, so we didn't see a need to actually install this type of facility at Blaine itself. There are other treatments at Blaine. So those would be the, the raised crosswalks uh, that, again, I would recommend be part of this package. Uh, we also have estimates on those, so we're putting all that together. The next piece would be a center median and pedestrian refuge. Uh, this would actually be located just east of Jefferson Street intersection. So City Hall is over here to the left. The high school, again, is back here um, to the bottom right. And the idea here is that there would be some sort of a center median, probably not this long, probably more from about here over, um, that creates that sense of place that you're entering into, or basically you're leaving the commercial zone and entering into a more residential and school zone to the east. Uh, so it's a bit of a gateway. Um, it could also uh, be extended, uh, as is shown in this option, further to the west so that we create that pedestrian refuge, such as that one picture was showing. This particular option is a wider version of the median. Um, maybe we don't necessarily want to go there because we lose more parking uh, versus a, a narrower version that's extended over a little bit further and creates a refuge. Go, go back to the previous one, please, Les. This one here. What about your west to south left turn movement? There's a lot of cars that make that. Yeah, well, keeping Did in mind push? that the, the vehicles are over here, and so making sure that they can make that swing is important in the design uh, I'm, process. I'm talking about westbound. On oh, sorry, west to south? Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, in this case, the, west, the southerly lane has been pushed clear to the, the curb line. That's what's out there today because we added the northbound bike lane through here and parking. That, that really moves that left-turning vehicle way to the north. It does. Being able to get around and across the intersection. That is true. That is true. Keeping in mind that there's parking and bike lanes and everything else in here, so the travel lane is up, up here, almost in the middle of the intersection, if you will. So yeah, there's considerations uh, in the design process about how all that works. Uh, a lot of it's going to depend on what ultimately we end up with the, the street section itself. Uh, and there's more to that than I'll present here today, but that'll be discussed with transportation and, and after. So that is uh, another item that I think um, could provide benefit within this particular grant program, especially if we can work in a pedestrian refuge as it just enhances the, the safety for the pedestrians crossing this a pretty busy intersection and a, and a fairly busy section of the corridor. I'm, I'm not sure you don't have more peds on the west side of that intersection than you do the east. It, it's possible. Just from what I see. Yeah, it is certainly possible. It's it's a busy intersection all the way around. Uh, this is just a, a shot of the D Street work that was done a couple summers ago. Just to give you an idea, we do have some of these in town. This is fairly narrow as compared to what we'd be talking about with this application, but this is the concept. So we'd have the center median uh, with some kind of a break in the middle, which is the refuge, preferably a little wider, and then some kind of a crossing crosswalk through here. Okay. So something like that. Another example in town, this is on uh, Deacon. Um, by the bookstore in the University of Idaho and their parking lot and they've got a couple of these on campus where they have a crosswalk here some kind of a little beginning of the center medium in this case they've added a vertical feature to help define it I had a question <coughs> the, the previous slide Les, I'm sorry about extra words but I'm no doing problem. it to you will there be lighting similar 
here too along the the corridor? We, we've not discussed yet um, this type of lighting, the the flash uh, rapid flash beacons in this particular location. We are talking about adding lighting on the school zone signs at the high school and potentially also at the elementary school. Um, that would be on a timed basis similar to what we do on South Main Street by the Plus Prairie Charter School. Yep. Those yep. lights come on at certain times of the day, typically when you're seeing pedestrians out there. Yep. So in the case of the high school, it's going to be morning, lunch, and afternoon. The elementary school typically would be morning, afternoon because they don't break out of the school for lunchtime. Yep. Um, that is something that we are looking at as part of the overall corridor, and I think it's probably something we should consider within this grant application as well, yeah. is lighting in both of those locations. The rapid flash beacon system here, this is pedestrian driven. So they come up, yes. they, you know, basically it's either, it's activated when somebody's there versus just the school zone lighting, which would be on a daily basis on a, t a set timer. Um, we've not gotten to the point in our discussions where we're recommending this type of a rapid flash system on Third Street yet? I, yeah, I don't. I don't feel strongly about the rapid flash. I feel strongly about the lighting. That's what catches you if you're, you know, on remote control driving through. It's the lights. Help remind folks that there is a school zone there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. And then um, the other part uh, has to do with curb extensions, and this where is where it's a little less defined. Uh, we have multiple plans with the the subcommittee looking at curb extensions. Um, they are a great pedestrian component because they serve to make pedestrians much more visible. They reduce crossing times, the length of crossings, all of that. Um, this is generally what they look like. Usually they're, they're applied where you've got a, a curb um, line parking strip here, and then you just bring that curb line out to the point where it is close to the nearest travel lane, whether it's a vehicle lane or a bike lane in this case. Um, and then back around the corner. The idea is that normally that pedestrian standing clear back here behind this curb line, if there's cars parked here, they're not terribly visible to oncoming traffic, right? If you create this curb extension or curb bulb, it brings that pedestrian out here much closer to the edge of the travel lane so their visibility is much higher around those parked vehicles. So this is a technique we have used within the city. This is um, by Lena, actually. Uh, on um, Blaine, um, you can see here where there's parking, there's a curb bulb that comes out. The pedestrian that usually was used to be back here is now clear out here, so much better visibility. Uh, just another shot looking north, Lena Elementary is to the right of us in this picture. So you can see the, the curb bulb up in this area and another one here. And how much it shortens that crosswalk length. So again, you're reducing exposure for pedestrians crossing the street, which particularly as it relates to elementary school children is highly important. So again, I think these kind of things fit very well within the tenets of this grant application uh, where we don't yet have a definition uh, on these is just how many and where. We have several plans that address it. Here's a couple of quick examples, portions of, of the overall corridor. This is from Cleveland to Roosevelt. What you can see here in the, the gray is existing. What's in this kind of magenta, pinkish color would be a proposed curb bulb in each of these corners on these uh, couple of blocks, a couple of intersections, all right? And so there would still be parking between them, but we would bring that pedestrian out and shorten that crosswalk and that crossing of 3rd Street. So that's one alternative that puts them essentially along the south side, plan A, and plan B, same block, moves them to the north side and flips the parking to the north side of the roadway. So these are alternatives that the committee is looking at and ultimately we'll have to decide how much of this to put into the grant application. What I'm thinking we'll do is we'll write them in along with all the other features we've already talked about um, with the idea that they may move around. Um, the idea is really just to get get it into the grant application. You know, We're not at a final design stage yet, obviously, uh, but having enough data there um, so that we can show it is a viable project within the timelines uh, specified by the grant. So. And one other item that's out there, just so you know, uh, probably would not be applied, but Plan C uh, includes the concept of a separated two-way bicycle lane like this. Um, from a bicycle perspective, it improves safety quite a bit. Um, from a pedestrian perspective, it isn't necessarily as big of, of an impact. 
Um, but that's out there in Plan C, just so you know. You'll, about, be, you you'll be seeing that later on. by a very quiet bicycle. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Amsterdam, watch it out. So the, uh, the narrative that they allow us for this application is two pages. <laughs> and so, but we are able to include um, attachments of five pages, including letters and emails, those types of things. So we'll include as much detail as we can in a letter from the Transportation Commission, I'm assuming, talking about the work of the um, committee that Les has been uh, meeting with twice a week. And, um, and we'll try to get as much information and the need in there in uh, that documentation as we can. Again, these applications are both due, um, the previous one and this one on the 21st. Yeah, so short timeline here. Yeah, yeah. short timeline with when uh, the Transportation Commission will be able to make its recommendation and then we can finalize our application. And then just to note, if I may, these projects have all been considered and are um, have some amount of budgeted funds budgeted within the FY18 budget, this grant would help us to um, supplement, supplement those funds. Um, it's not, if this grant does not go through, these improvements will still come along with the bridge project. Mm -hmm. just want to make clear that we've got options there, but it is nice that this project has come up or this opportunity has come up at this time. Mm -hmm. It's a great fit okay. for this type of project. And since this is still part of the House Bill 312, no match is required for this portion of it either? Like, right? It's a just a straight up grant with no match required? Correct. Okay. And it's $11 million for both projects we just talked about. Statewide. Mm -hmm. Statewide. Yeah. yeah. Total pool for, for both the um, surplus or the surplus eliminator for this for this um, pavement preservation and this project yes okay now just to note when okay. you say no match however these grants don't pay for engineering and design so that we will do those in-house or I'm assuming we would do those in-house especially with a quick turnaround so we really we have money in it when we say no match it's just that those are not eligible expenses of these types of projects right but the reason these work well is we're doing these projects regardless. Right. Right. It just right. becomes a question of how much we can do right. and how much further we could stretch city resources if we're successful in either of these. Um, I don't know what anybody else thinks, but I see no downside in applying for this either. All. So uh, all. I think we should recommend approval on the consent agenda of this application grant, unless anyone disagrees. Good. Do you, you, mm -hmm. want to, you want to talk about this one a little more? In an open open session. Uh, I think we'll have the opportunity to talk about all these things uh, as the transportation commission's plan okay. comes to fruition, and okay. it will become a regular agenda item on how we're going to proceed with the with the traffic calming situation and uh, bike okay. pedestrian facilities there on that project. So yeah, I'm just I probably don't need to do it on, in terms of the grant that the, the specifics will come to light. Yes. Okay. Deal. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And last. Thank you. Okay, uh, item number eight on today's agenda is the cancellation of December 26th uh, Public Works Finance Committee meeting. It's kind of been a traditional thing that the meeting right after Christmas we've... Um, so move. <laughs> <laughs> we've mm. aborted that one because no one's around for it anyway, so... Very quiet, very yeah, quiet yeah. that week. So, um, so <laughs> it's been moved and seconded, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I guess we'll move that forward and we'll come yeah. and cancel that meeting. Yeah. Um, other than that, if anyone, no one has anything else, I would suggest that we adjourn this meeting. I'd second that. Okay. Thank you very much.